The mysterious disappearance of Michael Legas in Grand Canyon National Park presents a narrative filled with unanswered questions and a search operation that gripped the attention of both authorities and the public. Michael Legas, a 39-year-old man from Toole, Utah, vanished without a trace, prompting an exhaustive search and investigation by the National Park Service and igniting concern among those who knew him and the wider community fascinated by the nature of his disappearance. On a seemingly ordinary day, October 31st of 2017, Michael set out to explore the Grand Canyon, a natural wonder known for its breathtaking views and treacherous terrain. It was at Mather Point, a popular viewpoint on the canyon's south rim, where Michael was last seen at approximately 12.15 p.m. This location, known for its panoramic vistas, would become the center of a perplexing mystery. Dressed in a blue hooded sweatshirt and blue Levi jeans, Michael, standing six foot tall and weighing around 230 pounds, with brown and graying hair and hazel eyes, blended into the crowd of tourists and adventurers. Unbeknownst to those around him, this might have been the last time anyone would see Michael Legas alive. As hours turned into days, concern for Michael's whereabouts grew. A friend, alarmed by his absence, reported him missing to the park authorities, triggering an immediate response from the Grand Canyon Rangers. The National Park Service launched a comprehensive search operation, scouring the area at Mather Point and extending their efforts along the rim trail between Pipe Creek and Mather Point in hopes of finding any trace of Michael. The Park Service also reached out to the public, urging anyone who might have seen or spoken to Michael to come forward with information, hoping that piece of the puzzle could lead them to his location. The search efforts, marked by a blend of hope and urgency, continued relentlessly until November 10th, when the grim discovery of a body below the south rim along the rim trail brought the operation to an end. The body, recovered by the National Park Service and believed to be that of Michael Legas, was transferred to the county medical examiner's office for identification and to conduct an investigation into the circumstances leading to his death. Michael's story, like many others who have gone missing in the grandeur and peril of the Grand Canyon, underscores the park's dual nature as a place of unparalleled beauty and inherent danger. The Grand Canyon, while inviting explorers and nature enthusiasts to immerse themselves in its splendor, also holds the potential for tragedy amidst its rugged cliffs and extreme weather conditions. Michael's disappearance and the subsequent discovery serves as a reminder of the respect and caution that such wild and unforgiving landscapes demand from those who venture into their depths. In 1978, amidst the sprawling expanse of the Grand Canyon's rugged terrain, a story unfolded that would etch itself into the records of unsolved mysteries. Jeffrey Ridenauer, a 63-year-old, embarked on a journey into the heart of one of nature's most formidable landscapes. An experienced hiker from Southern California, Jeffrey sought refuge from the monotony of urban life, yearning for the freedom and challenge offered by the vast wilderness. The Grand Canyon, a marvel of geological history and testament to the raw power of natural forces, was the backdrop for Jeffrey's ambitious trek. He planned to navigate the south rim of the canyon, a route he had braved only once before. His preparation was meticulous. He parked a station wagon in the Tanner Trails parking lot and had a bicycle strategically placed at the New Hans Trails end. Jeffrey's journey was to span between these points, traversing the Colorado River's banks, climbing cliffs, and navigating ledges that have witnessed eons of history. A note left on his bicycle served as a silent testament to his intentions. Hiking the canyon will be out by May 28th. It was a promise to the world and himself, a declaration of his resolve to conquer the challenges that lay ahead. However, the canyon, with its vast expanse of rock, sand, and silence, seemed to defy this very notion of life and death, swallowing up tales of those who dared to traverse its paths. Despite receiving a backcountry permit marked with caution due to his limited canyon hikes, Jeffrey's confidence in his physical capabilities persuaded the issuing ranger. The warnings of extreme temperatures, which had soared above 115 degrees, did little to deter him. The ranger, noting Jeffrey's articulate assurance and the heavy snowfall that winter which promised more water sources, reluctantly agreed to this journey. 
As the days passed, Jeffrey's absence became a growing concern. The permit he was supposed to return went unsubmitted, prompting a search that would soon reveal the mysterious disappearance of his vehicle. Initially absent from its designated spot, the Dodge Dart station wagon reappeared, suggesting a return that only deepened the mystery. Rangers speculated that Jeffrey might have come back to resupply, embarking once again into the canyon's depths. The subsequent search operation, launched on June 4th, was unprecedented in scale at the time. Over 50 ground searchers combed the terrain, helicopters circled overhead, and rappelling teams scoured the cliffs and ledges for any sign of Jeffrey. Yet, the canyon remained silent, offering no clues to his whereabouts. The discovery of a pair of glasses and a razor, meticulously placed on a rock near one of Jeffrey's supposed campsites, provided a fleeting hope, yet even these could not be definitively linked to him. As the search extended, covering over a hundred square miles of canyon country, the realization dawned that Jeffrey might never be found. The vastness of the Grand Canyon, with its myriad of hiding places and relentless flow of the Colorado River, seemed to have claimed another soul. Rangers contemplated the futility of scuba searches in the river's treacherous waters, resigning themselves to the likelihood that Jeffrey's remains would only surface with time, if at all. The mystery of Jeffrey Rittenauer's disappearance remains unsolved, a narrative lost to the echoes of the Grand Canyon. Despite one of the largest search operations in the park's history, no conclusive evidence has surfaced, leaving only speculation and unanswered questions. The lack of a single photograph or definitive clue has rendered Jeffrey's story a ghostly presence in the canyon's lore. Decades have passed since Jeffrey ventured into the Grand Canyon, never to be seen again. His story, one of adventure, ambition, and the unfathomable mysteries of nature, lingers as a cautionary tale. It reminds us of the canyon's indomitable spirit and the fine line between humanity's quest for adventure and the immutable forces of the natural world. Jeffrey Ridenour, in his pursuit of solitude and challenge, became a part of the Grand Canyon's mystique, a symbol of eternal dance between man and the wild, where some steps are forever lost in the shadows of towering cliffs and the roaring sound of the river below. In the heart of the Grand Canyon National Park, a baffling mystery began to unfold on June 2nd of 2015. Morgan Elias Heimer, a 22-year-old river guide and University of Wyoming English student, embarked on what was supposed to be an adventurous journey down the Colorado River. An experienced outdoorsman and a superb swimmer, Morgan's skills were well suited for the rigors of river guiding. However, no one could have predicted the strange turn of events that would soon transpire. Working for Tor West, a commercial rafting company, Morgan was guiding a group on an eight-day rafting trip. They had successfully navigated six days of their journey, approaching the peculiar and picturesque Pumpkin Springs at mile marker 213 on the river. Known for its orange rock formations and warm waters laced with toxic metals, Pumpkin Springs presents a unique backdrop to the trip. On that fateful afternoon, around 4 p.m., as the group was near the cliff by Pumpkin Springs, Morgan spoke with the lead guide. He mentioned needing some personal time that afternoon, a request not uncommon in such settings. The guide, momentarily distracted by a client, turned away. When he looked back, Morgan had vanished without a trace. Initially, the guide assumed Morgan had taken his break, but as the evening approached and Morgan failed to reappear, concern grew. The group continued their activities, swimming in the river and gathering for dinner, but Morgan's absence became increasingly alarming. At 7.26 p.m., one of the group members reported him missing. The search for Morgan commenced immediately, spearheaded by park rangers and search and rescue teams. They scoured the river and surrounding areas, extending from mile markers 211 to 215 and eventually to Diamond Creek, 12 miles west of Pumpkin Springs. Despite his skill and experience, which led investigators to believe he had a high chance of survival if lost, the search yielded no results. Fellow employees from Tor West, clients on the river trip, and other river guides and their groups were interviewed, but no clues emerged. As days passed, 
the likelihood of finding Morgan grew dimmer. Theories about his disappearance ranged from a tragic accident in the river's rapids, a fall from a cliff, or even a deliberate decision to disappear. The lack of evidence left all possibilities open, turning Morgan's case into a perplexing and unsolved mystery. The Grand Canyon, with its vast and rugged terrain, has been known to conceal its secrets well. In Morgan's case, it seemed to have done just that. Whether he met an accidental fate in the Colorado River, became lost in the wilderness, or chose a path that led him away from the tour remains unknown. His disappearance continues to be a source of speculation and intrigue for those who hear his story. The days following Morgan Elias Hamer's disappearance saw an intense and exhaustive search, but the Grand Canyon, with its treacherous terrain and sprawling expanse, offered no clues. The search teams, experienced in navigating the challenging environment of the canyon, were baffled. Morgan, with his background as a seasoned outdoorsman and an excellent swimmer, was equipped with the skills to survive in such a setting, yet there remained no sign of him. The mystery deepened as those who knew Morgan pondered over his sudden and unexplained absence. Born and raised in Cody, Wyoming, Morgan had spent his life immersed in nature. His love for the outdoors was evident from an early age. His pursuit of an English degree at the University of Wyoming was balanced with his passion for the wilderness, leading him to a career as a river guide. This balance of academic pursuits and outdoor adventures defined Morgan, making his disappearance all the more perplexing. The circumstances of that day in 2015 were scrutinized for clues. Morgan's conversation with the lead guide about taking some time off, the guide's brief distraction, and Morgan's subsequent disappearance presents a baffling sequence of events. Questions arose about Morgan's state of mind and intentions. Was this a spur-of-the-moment decision to seek solitude, or something more concerning? Without clear answers, speculation fills this void. As the search went on, theories varied. Some considered the possibility of an accidental fall into the river, a misstep on a treacherous canyon terrain, or an unfortunate encounter with the canyon's wildlife. Others contemplated more distressing possibilities, including the chance that Morgan might have been dealing with personal struggles, leading to a deliberate choice to walk away from his current life. Despite all these theories and speculations, the search teams remained focused on their mission. The area around Pumpkin Springs, known for its unique geographical features and the hazardous waters within, was thoroughly examined. The search extended to Diamond Creek, a remote location offering its own set of challenges. The efforts of the search teams, coupled with the interviews of those who were with Morgan on the trip, painted a picture of a young man in his prime element, yet who also mysteriously vanished. As the search was eventually scaled back, the absence of any definitive evidence left Morgan's fate uncertain. His description as a young man with a cross tattoo on his leg became a key point in the ongoing efforts to locate him. The community, both local and beyond, held on to hope, even as the chances of finding Morgan alive diminished. In the years that followed, Morgan's disappearance remained a topic of discussion and intrigue among those who traversed the Grand Canyon. His story, a blend of adventure and mystery, became part of the canyon's lore, a tale of a young man who ventured into its depths and never returned. When Morgan Heimer was last seen, he was described as a white male standing six feet tall, weighing around 175 pounds, with blonde hair and blue eyes. Morgan was last seen wearing a dark-colored personal flotation device, a blue plaid long sleeve shirt, flip-flops, a maroon baseball cap, brightly colored shorts, and carrying a purple water bottle. To this day, what happened to Morgan Elias Hamer on the banks of the Colorado River is a question that lingers. The Grand Canyon, a place of majestic beauty and hidden dangers, keeps its secrets well. Whether Morgan's fate was a result of misadventure, a personal crisis, or something else entirely remains a mystery, a haunting reminder of the canyon's unpredictable nature. Today we'll delve into the perplexing disappearance of a small aircraft in the vast wilderness of Alaska, a case that has captured the imaginations and hearts of many. Our story centers around Mason McLeod, a 26-year-old park ranger with a deep love for the natural world. 
Hailing from Jacksonville, Florida, Mason had an adventurous spirit that led him to the remote landscapes of Alaska and the dense swamps of the Everglades, where he dedicated his summers and winters to conserving the beauty and wilderness of these areas. On August 21st of 2010, Mason, alongside two brothers, Neil Spradlin, 28, and Seth Spradlin, 20, boarded a de Havilland Beaver float plane. The single-engine aircraft, piloted by Marco Aletto, who was 47 years old, was tasked with transporting this group from Swickshank Lagoon back to civilization in King Salmon. The flight, under normal circumstances, should have been a brief journey through the skies of Alaska a path taken by many before without incident. However, this particular flight vanished into the Alaskan wilderness, leaving no trace. The disappearance of the aircraft with its four souls aboard transformed into a mystery that has echoed through the years. The vast, untouched expanse of Alaska, known for its beauty as much as its unforgiving nature, swallowed the plane whole, sparking one of the most extensive search and rescue operations in the area. What happened to Mason McLeod, the Spratlin brothers, and Marco Aletto that day? As we piece together their story, we confront the immense power of nature and the limits of human understanding. Stay with us as we attempt to unravel a puzzle that nature has kept closely guarded for over a decade. In the heart of Alaska's wilderness, a narrative unfolds that captures the essence of mystery and the unpredictable wrath of nature. The flight in question, a mission under the banner of routine yet vital work, was tasked with a purpose that bespoke of preservation and care. Their mission was clear, to retrieve a team of National Park Service maintenance workers. These workers had been stationed in the remote lagoon, laying the groundwork for the reconstruction of an old ranger station, a project critical for the continued stewardship of the park's natural resources. However, as in often the case of the vast wilderness of Alaska, the plan was at the mercy of the elements. The expected route, a well-trodden path in the sky, promised a straightforward passage from Swickshank Lagoon to King Salmon. This journey, typically less than an hour's flight, was one that pilot Marco Aletto and his passengers were prepared for. Yet Alaska's weather is as unpredictable as it is beautiful, capable of changing with little warning and posing a formidable challenge to even the most experienced aviators. On that fateful day, as the beaver lifted off, the weather conditions began to deteriorate rapidly. What was expected to be a clear flight path soon became fraught with difficulty. The skies, once welcoming, turned against them, cloaking their journey in uncertainty. The sudden shift in weather conditions is a critical piece of the puzzle in understanding the disappearance of the flight. The vast Alaskan wilderness, coupled with rapidly changing weather, set the stage for a mystery that would captivate and confound in equal measure. The disappearance of this flight is a reminder of the unpredictable nature of Alaskan wilderness. The flight's purpose, the conditions it faced, and the route it intended to take are all pieces of a larger narrative, one that speaks to the inherent risks and unpredictability of flying in one of the world's last great frontiers. As news of the disappearance rippled through the communities connected to the passengers and the vast wilderness of Alaska, an immediate and concerted emergency response was mobilized. This operation drew together a diverse array of search teams, each bringing their own expertise to the forefront in hopes of locating the missing de Havilland Beaver. Among these were the Coast Guard and the Alaska State Police, organizations well versed in the complexities and dangers of rescue operations in such unforgiving environments. Their involvement underscored the seriousness of the situation and the urgent need to find the aircraft and its occupants. However, the search for the missing plane and its passengers was fraught with challenges that tested the limits of human determination and technological capabilities. The weather conditions, which had played a critical role in the aircraft's disappearance, continued to hamper the search efforts. Visibility was often poor, and the unpredictable nature of the Alaskan weather meant that the search teams had to be constantly vigilant and adaptable. Moreover, the terrain over which the search was conducted added layers of complexity to an already daunting task. Alaska's landscape is renowned for its rugged beauty, but the same terrain made the search operation exceedingly difficult. Vast expanses of wilderness, dense forests, and towering mountains created a labyrinth environment in which finding the missing aircraft was akin to finding a needle in a haystack. 
Compounding these physical and environmental challenges was the absence of signals from the plane's emergency locator transmitter. Such signals could have significantly narrowed the search area and provided a beacon of hope for rescuers. The silence from the transmitter added a layer of mystery and urgency to the search as each passing moment without a signal dimmed the hopes of finding the plane quickly and safely. Amidst the logistical, environmental hurdles faced by the search teams, the emotional toll on the families and friends of those aboard the missing flight was palpable. Scott Arnold, the uncle of Mason McLeod, provided a reflection of his anguish. His statement captured the helplessness and desperation felt by those waiting for news of their loved ones. We're living off the internet to see what's going on, he said, encapsulating a sense of reliance on any scrap of information that might lead to the whereabouts of Mason and the others. Arnold's words highlighted not just the physical search taking place in the Alaskan wilderness, but also the emotional search for answers and closure undertaken by those left behind. The weeks following the disappearance of the plane were marked by an anxious and tireless search across the Alaskan wilderness. Hope and despair ebbed and flowed with each passing day until a pivotal moment brought a grim resolution to the mystery. Debris from the missing aircraft was finally spotted by a local helicopter pilot, navigating the rugged terrain that had so thoroughly hidden the plane's final resting place. This discovery, made on a narrow section of beach on the northern coast of Katmai National Park, confirmed the worst fears of those who had held out hope for a different outcome. The pieces of wreckage, identifiable by the tail number, showed the reality of the crash, offering somber closure to the extensive search efforts. In the aftermath of the discovery, the National Transportation Safety Board embarked on a meticulous investigation to unravel the events leading up to the crash. Given the absence of a flight recorder, the board faced a daunting task in piecing together the aircraft's final moments. Their findings, while inconclusive regarding the specific sequence of events, pointed to a probable cause that was as unsettling as it was vague the pilot's temporary unresponsiveness for reasons that could not be established. This conclusion, while providing some answers, left a lingering sense of uncertainty and highlighted the inherent challenges in understanding and mitigating the risks of aviation in such remote settings. The incident and the subsequent investigation brought to the forefront the inherent dangers of flying in Alaska's vast and unforgiving landscapes. Alaska's reliance on small aircraft for transportation is well documented given the state's rugged terrain and the remote locations of many of its communities and critical infrastructure. This dependence, while a testament to the resilience and adaptability of Alaskans, also underscores the risks associated with aviation in such challenging conditions. The weather can change swiftly and without warning, transforming a routine flight into a perilous journey. The crash of this aircraft served as a stark reminder of these dangers, prompting reflections on the safety measure and protocols in place for aviation in one of the world's most beautiful yet treacherous flying environments. In the wake of the tragedy, the communities touched by the lives of Mason McLeod, Neil and Seth Spradlin, and Marco Aletto sought ways to honor their memory and legacy. Mason, with his dedication to the preservation of the natural landscapes in both Alaska and the Everglades, left a lasting impact on those who knew him and worked alongside him. The National Park Service, recognizing the profound loss of three of its own and a devoted pilot, commemorated their service and contributions with heartfelt tributes. Across the vast expanse of wilderness they sought to protect and serve, their names and stories endure, inspiring current and future generations of park rangers and aviators alike. The incident, while steeped in sorrow, prompted a critical examination of flight safety protocols and park service operations in remote areas. The National Park Service, alongside the aviation authorities, revisited and reinforced the importance of stringent safety measures, including the functionality and reliability of emergency locator transmitters. The lessons learned from the crash underscore the unpredictable nature of flying in Alaska's rugged terrain and the imperative of preparedness and caution. Training programs for pilots and Park Service employees were scrutinized and enhanced, aiming to equip them with the knowledge and skills necessary to navigate the challenges posed by remote operations. Moreover, the incident catalyzed discussions on the broader implications for flight safety in remote areas, 
It highlighted the need for continuous improvement in the technologies used for search and rescue operations and for a deeper understanding of the environmental factors that can so drastically affect the safety of flight paths. Communities, aviation companies, and governmental agencies renewed their commitment to working together to ensure that the skies over Alaska and similar environments remain as safe as possible for those who venture into them. In the remembrance of the lost, their legacy fosters a culture of safety and vigilance that transcends the boundaries of national parks and remote wilderness areas. The lessons drawn from their story inform ongoing efforts to protect the lives of those who explore, serve, and protect the natural world. Through improved safety measures, enhanced training, and a collective commitment to remembering the past, the tragedy serves as a beacon, a guiding effort to prevent future loss in the challenging, yet awe-inspiring frontiers that they so cherished. In the vast and rugged expanse of the Kaibab National Forest, Adjacent to the awe-inspiring Grand Canyon, a baffling mystery unfolded in the summer of 2001. This is the puzzling tale of 13-year-old Justin Richardson, whose disappearance has left an indelible mark on the dense wilderness of Coconino County, Arizona. Justin, known for his adventurous spirit and deep affinity for nature, embarked on what was supposed to be an exhilarating exploration with three friends who were significantly older all between the ages of 18 and 21. Their shared passion for the wild and a strong sense of camaraderie led them deep into the forest's heart. However, the adventure took an ominous turn when two of their group inadvertently strayed off the path, putting the trip in total disarray. In their concern for the safety of their lost companions, Justin and his remaining friend made the fateful decision to split up. They sought assistance from a stranger they encountered in the wilderness, a rugged individual whose presence in the forest was as mysterious as it was puzzling. While the stranger ventured back into the forest to search for the missing hikers, Justin and his friends hurried to alert the authorities. As search and rescue efforts unfolded, the two lost hikers were eventually found, shaken but physically unharmed. However, amidst the chaos, Justin mysteriously vanished, leaving no trace behind. The news of his disappearance sent shockwaves to the small community of Tsayan, a town near the Grand Canyon where Justin lived with his father. Justin's relationship with the Kaibab National Forest was profound. He had traversed its trails numerous times, each expedition honing his resilience and deepening his understanding of the terrain. Yet beneath the surface of his disappearance lay a web of complexities and troubling speculations. Justin had a history of running away, and rumors began to swirl that he might have chosen to vanish deliberately, perhaps hitchhiking his way out of the wilderness. There was talk that he might have been headed to Chicago, driven by a longing to reunite with his girlfriend who awaited him there. However, the Coconino County Sheriff's Department harbored a grimmer theory. They suspected foul play, an encounter in the forest depths that might have had sinister consequences. The investigation into Justin's disappearance was exhaustive. Authorities combed through the forest, interviewed witnesses, and delved into every aspect of Justin's life. They learned about his complex home life, his popularity, and his tendency to be independent and occasionally rebellious. It was revealed that Justin and his companions had ventured into the forest with the intention of using drugs. Evidence suggested he had been experimenting with drugs and alcohol for about a year before his disappearance. One of the most puzzling aspects of the case was the behavior of the man who had last seen Justin. After becoming separated from the boy, this individual experienced a methamphetamine-induced blackout. When he woke up hours later, Justin was gone. The man eventually emerged from the forest and hitchhiked back to Tusayan, yet he did not report Justin missing at the time. Justin's disappearance was not reported until three days later on July 2nd by his family. The delay in reporting and the initial lack of urgency by the authorities hampered the search efforts. His father, who lived in Tusayan, and his mother, residing in Flagstaff, were engulfed in fear and confusion as the search for their son intensified. 
Despite the extensive search efforts, which included covering 64 miles of forest on foot, horseback, and on helicopter, no trace of Justin was ever found. The mystery deepened in 2014 when the Cole Case Unit uncovered evidence suggesting Justin had returned to the area near the Moqui Lodge after he was last seen. The nature of this evidence was not disclosed, adding another layer of mystery to the case. Over the years, Justin's case had been plagued by various theories. Some investigators believed he could have been a victim of homicide in the forest around the time that he went missing. Others considered the possibility of him running away to start a new life. Yet, the lack of any confirmed sightings, the absence of any activity on his social security number, and the fact that he left without any personal belongings or money pointed towards a more tragic outcome. The Coconino County Sheriff's Department has kept the case active, continuing to track persons of interest and follow up on leads. One of the men Justin was with on that fateful day is now deceased, an event that the authorities say does not appear related to Justin's disappearance. The mystery of what happened to Justin Richardson in the Kaibab National Forest remains unsolved, a haunting puzzle that continues to perplex investigators and haunt those who knew him. The dense forest, with its majestic beauty and hidden dangers, holds the secrets of that summer day, secrets that have yet to be revealed. Anyone with information is encouraged to contact the Coconino County Sheriff's Cold Case Division in hopes that one day the mystery of Justin Richardson's disappearance will be solved. In the early 20th century, a love story intertwined with mystery began aboard a passenger ship traveling from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Glenn Roland Hyde, a spirited individual from Kimberly, Idaho, and Bessie Lewis Haley, an artistic soul from Parkersburg, West Virginia, met and quickly fell in love. Their romance was a whirlwind, leading swiftly to marriage. Glenn, a University of Idaho alumnus, managed his family's farm, while Bessie, initially married to Earl Helmy, moved to San Francisco to pursue her artistic dreams. Facing resistance from Earl for a divorce, Bessie relocated to Elko, Nevada, fulfilling residency requirements, and finally divorcing on April 12th of 1928. The next day, she married Glenn in Twin Falls, Idaho, setting the stage for a remarkable journey. Their honeymoon was far from typical. The Hydes envisioned an audacious adventure, a boat trip down the Green and Colorado rivers, navigating through the treacherous Grand Canyon. Glenn, an experienced outdoorsman, aimed to set a speed record for the canyon run, and Bessie aspired to become the first documented woman to traverse the Grand Canyon via the Colorado River. The couple built a homemade boat, a 20-foot long, 5.5-foot wide, and 3-foot deep flat bottom sweep scow from 2x4 planks. Despite Bessie's lack of river experience, they embarked on their journey with determination. Their path took them through Labyrinth, Stillwater, and the Cataract Canyons, with the Grand Canyon posing the ultimate challenge. During their journey, the couple experienced close calls, with Glenn falling overboard and Bessie nearly being tossed overboard by the rapids. On October 20th of 1928, six months after their wedding, they began their journey from Green River, Utah. Their boat was unique, likened to a coffin by an adeptive riverman due to its unusual design compared to typical river crafts. This leg of their journey saw smooth sailing initially, but as they reached the Grand Canyon, the true test of their adventure began. Upon reaching Bright Angel Creek in the Grand Canyon on November 15th of 1928, they set a new record for their expedition. However, the most dangerous part of their journey was still ahead. They ascended the Bright Angel Trail to Grand Canyon Village on the South Rim, where they resupplied and met Emery Kolb, a famed photographer and river navigator. Kolb, concerned for their safety, offered life jackets and an inner tube, but Glenn declined, confident in their swimming abilities. Kolb also observed Bessie's hesitance, perhaps due to exhaustion or fear of the upcoming rabbits. Despite Kolb's warnings, the couple persisted. They were photographed by Kolb before leaving the South Rim on November 16th of 1928 after being interviewed by newspapers. 
These photographs would become the last known images of the couple. They picked up Adolf Sutro at Phantom Ranch, but after leaving him at Hermit Camp two days later, they vanished, leaving behind a mystery that would captivate the world for decades. When the Hydes failed to arrive in Needles, California, by their expected date, Glenn's father, R.C. Hyde, initiated a search. He organized river parties, enlisted Native American trackers, and secured authorization for an aerial search. The discovery of their boat adrift near mile marker 225 around December 19th was a pivotal moment in the search. The boat was intact, with all their supplies still on board, but Glenn and Bessie were nowhere to be found. The mystery of their disappearance led to various theories and rumors. Some speculated an accident in the rapids, while others pondered foul play or a deliberate disappearance. Over the years, these theories have evolved in new, mysterious ways and findings. In 1971, an elderly woman on a commercial rafting trip claimed to be Bessie Hyde, alleging she had stabbed Glenn and escaped the canyon. However, she later recanted this story. After her death in 1992, a pistol and a copy of the Hyde's marriage certificate were found in her belongings. This stirred speculation. However, the discrepancies in appearance and background seems to discredit her story. The discovery of a male skeleton on Emery Kolb's property in 1976, initially thought to be Glenn's, was later identified as an unrelated suicide victim from 1933. This discovery, coupled with later analysis, ruled out the possibility of the remains being Glenn's. The Hyde story remains shrouded in mystery, with the exact details of their disappearance still unknown. Theories range from accidental drowning to more sinister possibilities, yet, without conclusive evidence, their fate remains a topic of speculation and intrigue. The Grand Canyon, with its majestic beauty and hidden dangers, holds the secret of what truly happened to Glenn and Bessie Hyde on their adventurous and ill-fated honeymoon journey. Their disappearance is a stark reminder of the unpredictable nature of the Grand Canyon and its waters. The legacy of Glenn and Bessie Hyde lives on, not just as a tale of adventure and romance, but as a haunting mystery of the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon. In the heart of the summer, under the relentless sun of the Arizona sky, Dr. Sarah Beadle set out with her daughter and nephew on a journey into the Grand Canyon a testament to nature's grandeur and its unforgiving beauty. An emergency room physician from Fort Worth, Texas, Sarah was not only skilled in the art of healing, but also possessed an adventurous spirit, a passion for the outdoors that she was eager to share with her family. The trip to the Grand Canyon was part of a larger exploration, a venture that had already taken them to the wonders of Yellowstone National Park. Sarah, an experienced backpacker, had meticulously planned this hike, aiming to traverse the South Kaibab Trail, a path renowned for its stunning vistas, but equally notorious for its challenging terrain and conditions. The day began with promise as they descended into the canyon, the vast landscapes unfolding before them. However, as the sun climbed higher, the temperature soared, transforming the canyon from a picturesque marvel into a formidable adversary. The trail, with its lack of shade and absence of water sources, soon exacted its toll. Laura, Sarah's ten-year-old daughter, began showing signs of heat exhaustion, a perilous condition in such an extreme environment, marked by dizziness and dehydration. Faced with this dire situation, Sarah made a critical decision, a decision born out of a mother's instinct to protect her child at any cost. She left Laura and her 11-year-old nephew in what seemed a safe spot, embarking on a solo mission to find water and assistance. As Sarah ventured further, the unforgiving terrain of the Grand Canyon seemed to shift around her. The exact moment she took a wrong turn remains a mystery, a silent witness to the tragedy that unfolded. This wrong turn was a pivotal moment, leading her away from her intended destination into the depths of the canyon's embrace. The details of her journey after this point are shrouded in uncertainty, the canyon keeping its secrets as it has with countless others who have ventured into its depths. Back at their makeshift refuge, the children's fate took a fortunate turn when a fellow hiker stumbled upon them. 
This stranger, whose timely intervention brought relief, provided the children with water and guided them to the safety of a nearby camp. Meanwhile, the search for Sarah intensified, a race against time in the elements, as park rangers and volunteers scoured the vast expanse of the canyon. The discovery of Sarah's body near the Black Bridge, a mere three quarters of a mile from Phantom Ranch, brought the search to a heartbreaking conclusion. The canyon, with its deceptive beauty, had claimed another soul. Located on the north side of the Colorado River, her final resting place was a stark reminder of the perilous nature of this majestic wilderness. The cause of Sarah's death, while not immediately known, was suspected to be heat exhaustion, a silent thief of life in a harsh desert environment. The aftermath of the tragedy saw an outpouring of grief and support for the Beetle family. Scott Beetle, through a Facebook post, shared the devastating news of his wife's passing. The response was overwhelming, with hundreds of messages of condolences and prayers and shared memories flooding in. Sarah was remembered not just as a dedicated physician who worked at Baylor Emergency Medical Center, but as a vibrant, loving mother and an avid adventurer. Her brother, Charles Lawrence Springer, reminisced about Sarah's journey with her children, highlighting her love for sharing the wonders of nature with them. As the National Park Service and the County Medical Examiner began their investigation into the circumstances leading up to Sarah's death, her story continued to resonate with many. It was a somber reminder of the unpredictability and often perilous nature of outdoor adventures, underscoring the importance of preparation and caution. Sarah's passion for adventure, her love for her family, and her tragic end in the vast expanse of the Grand Canyon will be remembered as a reminder of aspiration, love, and the profound risks inherent in the pursuit of adventures. On a scorching day marked by the unforgiving sun casting its relentless rays over the rugged landscape of the Grand Canyon, Arturo, accompanied by his younger sister, Veronica Morgan, embarked on what was supposed to be a memorable hike along the Hermit Trail. Enthusiasm and anticipation filled the air as they ventured into the vast expanse of the canyon, unaware of the ordeal that laid ahead. As they navigated the treacherous terrain, Arturo began to experience severe cramping, a precursor to the dire situation that would soon unfold. The decision to split up, made at a critical juncture when Arturo could no longer proceed, set the stage for a series of events that would test his will to survive. Veronica, in a desperate bid to seek help, struggled to make her way back up the canyon, leaving Arturo alone and vulnerable. The subsequent 48 hours would become a testament to Arturo's resilience, stranded and isolated. With only his thoughts and dwindling supplies, he faced the stark reality of his mortality. Dehydration took its toll, rendering him too weak to stand, let alone signal for help. In those moments of despair, Arturo prepared himself for the worst, his hopes pinned on the slim chance of rescue. Meanwhile, Emily Hernandez, Arturo's wife, frantically reached out to the rescue services upon realizing that her husband and her sister-in-law had not returned home. The urgency of the situation was palpable as rescue teams from Arizona launched a comprehensive search operation. Equipped with helicopters and ground crews, they scoured the vast and rugged terrain of the Grand Canyon in search of Arturo. Miraculously, after enduring two harrowing days in the wilderness, Arturo's prayers were answered. A rescue helicopter, guided by the faint hope of finding him alive, managed to locate him. In a dramatic rescue operation, a rescuer was lowered down a 150-foot line to reach Arturo, who, despite his weakened state, managed to muster the strength to signal his location. He was then hoisted up, clinging to life at the end of the rope, and flown to safety. Arturo's survival story is a harrowing reminder of the unpredictable nature of outdoor adventures and the importance of preparedness. Despite having enough water for the initial hike, he was ill-equipped for the extended ordeal. His experience underscores the critical need for adequate supplies and contingency plans when exploring remote and challenging environments. Arturo recovered in a Flagstaff hospital, surrounded by the love and relief of his family. His story serves as a beacon of hope and a testament to the human spirit's ability to endure against the odds. It's a stark reminder of the fragility of life and the strength that lies within us to confront and overcome the most daunting of challenges.
On a crisp day late in October of 1963, two adventurous spirits, Helen Mower and Margaret Ivysick, set out to conquer the rugged terrains of Mount Cahaden, the highest peak in Maine. Hailing from Concord, Massachusetts, the duo, seasoned in the art of hiking, embarked on their journey with enthusiasm, choosing the cathedral trail for their ascent. The morning air was filled with anticipation of the challenges and beauty that lay ahead. As they ascended, the landscape around them transformed. The dense forest canopy gave way to rocky outcroppings, and the path narrowed as they neared the Baxter Peak. It was around 1.30 p.m. when they finally reached the summit, their spirits high from the accomplishment. There, amidst the breathtaking vistas that stretched endlessly before them, they paused to celebrate, sharing a lunch that tasted of triumph. We made it. This view is incredible. It really is. Everything tastes better up here, doesn't it? Definitely. I was worried about the narrow path. But here we are. It's like the mountain was guiding us. Can't believe it's already 1.30. Time flies. This is a moment I'll never forget. Same here. Cheers to our victory and many more adventures. However, as they prepared to descend, an unforeseen tension emerged between the two. The mountain, with its serene beauty, was indifferent to the human narratives unfolding on its slopes. Margaret, driven by a desire for adventure, suggested that they bushwhack directly down the headwall to Chimney Pond. This route, untamed and unmarked, promised a shortcut through the wilderness, a direct path that veered off the beaten track. Helen, on the other hand, felt a surge of apprehension at the thought. She knew the mountain's beauty was matched by its dangers. The unpredictable terrain and the risk of disorientation were too great. Preferring the safety and familiarity of the Dudley Trail, the path they had initially taken, she voiced her concerns. The disagreement between the two friends was profound, touching on the very essence of what it meant to explore. To bushwhack was to embrace the unknown, to confront the wilderness in its rawest form. Yet, to follow the established path was to respect the mountain's power, acknowledging the fine line between adventure and peril. In the end, they chose different paths. Margaret laughed off Helen's warnings. Her decision was made. She would take the mountain on her terms, disappearing into the wilderness with a determination that bordered on defiance. Helen, with a heavy heart, watched her friend venture into the unknown before turning back to the safety of the Dudley Trail. As Margaret stood at the crossroads, the mountain's indifferent beauty called to her adventurous spirit, promising a raw, untamed journey through the wilderness. The tension with Helen, rooted in their contrasting desires for safety and exploration, couldn't sway her. Margaret saw the unmarked path to Chimney Pond not just as a route, but as a challenge, a secret whispered by the mountain itself. Choosing to bushwhack was more than a divergence from the Dudley Trail. It was an embrace of the unknown, a step into a world unscripted by human footsteps. The disagreement with Helen touched on something deeper a fundamental difference in how they viewed the wilderness. For Margaret, the mountain's allure lay in its mysteries and the promise of discovery in its most unadulterated form. With a mix of excitement and a hint of defiance, Margaret stepped away from the beaten path, her decision shrouded in mystery. What lay ahead was unknown, the, the mountain's silent promise of adventure, her only guide. As she disappeared into the wilderness, a sense of mystery lingered in the air her journey a testament to the allure of the path less traveled. This moment of separation, marked by a mixture of emotions, excitement, worry, and the thrill of the unknown, would later be shrouded in mystery. The decision to part ways, made on a mountain that has witnessed countless stories of human endeavor, set the stage for a tale that would captivate the imagination of many. The mountain, silent and majestic, offered no clues as to what lay ahead, its secrets hidden among the shadows and the light that danced across its ancient face. As twilight began to cast its shadow over Mount Katahdin, the serene atmosphere at Chimney Pond was pierced by a growing sense of unease. Helen Mower, having descended via the familiar path of the Dudley Trail, arrived to find the area missing her friend. 
the realization that her friend was not there to greet her, as agreed, sent a ripple of worry through Helen's heart. The pond, usually a mirror reflecting the tranquil beauty of the mountain, now seemed to echo her deepening concern. Helen waited at the trailhead, her eyes fixed on the path where Margaret had disappeared hours ago. The silence around her felt charged, as if holding its breath. Their parting, marked by Margaret's defiant laughter, now echoed ominously in Helen's mind. She had chosen the safety of the Dudley Trail, a decision that seemed painfully prudent as shadows began to stretch and Margaret remained absent. The mountain, indifferent and majestic, kept its secrets as Helen's anxiety deepened. Margaret's quest for adventure, to embrace the wild unknown, haunted Helen. What had she found beyond the beaten path? The mystery of Margaret's fate grew with each unanswered call, each minute that passed. As dusk approached, Helen's worry transformed into a resolve tinged with fear. The wilderness was a realm of beauty and danger, its mysteries deep and potentially perilous. Margaret, with her unwavering spirit, had ventured into this unknown, leaving Helen to grapple with the possibilities of what lay hidden in the mountain's embrace. Waiting in the fading light, Helen was caught in a tale of suspense, her imagination conjuring scenarios filled with shadow and uncertainty. The mountain's serene facade belied the unknown challenges Margaret faced alone. Helen stood at the threshold of mystery, her concern for her friend mingling with a deep, unsettling sense of the mysterious unknown that had claimed Margaret's curiosity, and now, perhaps, Margaret herself. The weather, as if in tune with Helen's anxiety, began to shift. The once clear skies darkened, and a foreboding chill swept through the air, signaling the approach of a storm. Mount Katahdin, known for its sudden and severe weather changes, was living up to its reputation. As Helen called out into the encroaching darkness, her voice seemed small against the vastness of the wilderness. Then, unexpectedly, a response cut through the silence. Margaret's voice, calling for help, carried down from a headwall, an imposing barrier of rock that stood between her and safety. She was trapped, unable to advance or retreat. The urgency in her voice was clear, even from a distance, painting a vivid picture of her predicament. Faced with this dire situation, Helen rushed to the ranger station, where she found Ranger Ralph Heath. Heath, an experienced guardian of the park, listened intently as Helen recounted the events. Despite the worsening weather, which would make any rescue attempt perilous, Heath recognized the gravity of the situation. The mountain indifferent to the fates of those who dared its paths, was closing in with its storm. Ralph Heath, no stranger to the mountain's nature, felt a deep responsibility for the souls under his watch. His initial hesitation, born from a knowledge of the risks involved, was quickly overshadowed by a resolve to act. As the storm unleashed its fury on the mountain, Ralph Heath, the park ranger, geared up with a sense of urgency. The wilderness before him, usually a place of serene beauty, now roared with a tempest that veiled its dangers even further. Ralph's mind was focused on one goal, rescuing Margaret. Her decision to venture off the established trails into the storm's heart was a gamble that now placed her life in his hands. The mountain, transformed by the storm, became a maze of challenges. Ralph knew the terrain well, yet the storm's wrath turned familiar paths into treacherous unknowns. He pondered Margaret's drive for adventure her desire to confront the wilderness at its most raw. He respected the call of the wild, but knew all too well the respect it demanded in return. With each step against the howling wind and driving rain, Ralph's resolve deepened. Visibility was near zero, the path ahead obscured by a curtain of water and mist. Yet, he moved forward, driven by duty and a deep-seated belief in the sanctity of life. Margaret's safety was his charge, her well-being a beacon guiding him through the tempest. The mission was more than a job for Ralph. It was a duty to the bond between humans and nature, a challenge he accepted without hesitation. His thoughts, a mix of concern for Margaret and determination, propelled him forward. In the heart of the storm, Ralph Heath stood as a steadfast protector, committed to navigating the perilous mountain to bring Margaret back from the brink. The life of a hiker hung in the balance, and in the world of wilderness rescue, timing could mean the difference between life and death. Thus, with determination etched into his features, Heath made the decision to intervene directly. 
The pending storm, the uncertain terrain, and the fading light would not deter him. In that moment, he embodied the spirit of those who serve as stewards of the wild, those who step forward when the wilderness calls, regardless of the potential risks. This unfolding crisis, set against the backdrop of Mount Katahdin's rugged landscape, was more than a test of survival. It was a testament to the bonds formed in the face of adversity, the duty of those tasked with safeguarding nature's domain, and the unpredictable drama that the mountain stages for those who venture onto its slopes. As Helen and Ranger Heath prepared to confront the challenge before them, the mountain awaited, its silence a profound reminder of the mysteries that it held. Under a cloak of gathering clouds and whispering winds, a story of bravery and determination unfolded. Ranger Ralph Heath, standing at the threshold of night and the unknown, made a critical decision to reach out to Margaret, stranded and alone on a treacherous headwall. His voice, a beacon in the darkness, traversed the cold air, advising her to stay put and not move. The promise of help was on the horizon, a sliver of hope in the vast wilderness. In the heart of a storm, where rain and snow blurred the lines between night and wilderness, I stand determined. The silence of the mountain amidst the chaos of the weather is a backdrop to the urgency at hand. Margaret is out there, alone and vulnerable, and the responsibility to guide her to safety weighs heavily on me. Stay put, do not move, I instructed, my words cutting through the howl of the wind and the veil of snow. This was our sliver of hope amidst the vast storm-wracked wilderness. The promise of help I extended to Margaret was a pledge steeped in the duty and resolve that defined my role as a ranger. Despite the storm's fury, my determination did not waver. This moment, a test of our collective bravery and will, underscored my commitment to safeguard those who venture into the mountain's embrace, no matter the wrath of Despite the wisdom of waiting for daylight and the strength of numbers, the urgency of the situation pierced Heath's seasoned heart. The mountain, indifferent to the dramas enacted upon its slopes, was a silent observer as Heath prepared for a rescue attempt that defied all the odds. As night enveloped the landscape, at around 11 p.m., he embarked on a solitary journey up the Dudley Trail, a path he knew as well as the back of his hand, yet it now took a new dimension under the veil of darkness and of the incoming storm. The night rescue attempt, fraught with challenges, was a testament to Heath's resolve. The mountain's unpredictable nature, coupled with the absence of light, rendered the path both a physical and psychological maze. Although he could not reach Margaret, his determination led him to pinpoint her exact location, a crucial piece of the puzzle in the desperate search and for her safety. As dawn broke, painting the sky with strokes of light and hope, Heath, undeterred by the night's failures, devised a new plan. At 6.10 a.m., with the first light guiding his steps, he decided to ascend directly up the headwall. This decision, bold and fraught with peril, was driven by a singular focus, to provide comfort and reassurance to Margaret. The headwall, a formidable barrier of rock and ice, stood as a silent challenge to Heath's resolve. This daylight rescue effort was more than just a physical endeavor, it was a race against time and the elements. Heat's intention to stabilize and console Margaret until further help could arrive was a beacon of human spirit and resilience. The mountain, a timeless witness to countless tales of courage and loss, watched as one man's determination to save another life pushed him to the limits of his endurance and beyond. In these moments, the bond between rescuer and stranded hiker became a narrative thread woven into the fabric of Mount Kahadin's mystery. The rescue attempts, marked by moments of hope, fear, and unwavering courage, highlighted the profound connection between humans and the natural world. A relationship defined by respect, challenge, and the innate desire to aid those in peril. As Heath climbed, each step was a testament to the depths of human compassion and the indomitable will to make a difference, no matter the odds or the cost. As Ranger Ralph Heath pressed onward, the skies above Mount Kahadin began to brood with a foreboding intensity. Nature, in its untamed and unpredictable majesty, was setting the stage for a dramatic confrontation. A nor'easter, vast and relentless, swept across the landscape with a ferocity that transformed the mountain into an impenetrable fortress of snow, wind, and chilling silence. 
This sudden turbulence was not just a storm, but a barrier between hope and despair, making any rescue operation not just difficult, but seemingly futile. The world around Heath and Margaret shrank to the immediate and the elemental. Visibility was swallowed whole by the blizzard, erasing the line between earth and sky, leaving only a white void where landmarks once stood. The howling winds became a constant companion, a reminder of the mountain's power to isolate and intimidate even the most seasoned souls. In this whiteout, Heath and Margaret found themselves not just geographically stranded, but suspended in a moment of profound isolation. The storm, in its overwhelming presence, seemed to erase time, reducing the vast wilderness to an intimate theater of human endurance and nature's indomitable will. Rescue efforts, once a beacon of hope, were halted, leaving the pair in a limbo dictated by the whims of the storm. The desperation of their situation was palpable, a test of spirit and survival against the backdrop of an indifferent universe. The mountain, shrouded in its winter fury, became a realm of shadows and whispers, where the line between life and the eternal seemed to blur. This was not just a mere physical struggle, but a journey into the heart of mystery itself, where the forces of nature conspired to weave a tale of human vulnerability and resilience. Ralph found Margaret as the storm made its presence felt on the mountain. They took shelter together, bracing against the storm's increasing ferocity. Meanwhile, a ranger sergeant ventured toward Chimney Pond, only to encounter whiteout conditions and gale force winds by the basin. Standing in the rescue center, watching the storm unleash gale force winds, snow, and lightning outside, I'm caught in frustration and concern. The decision not to launch a rescue operation in these conditions is one of the hardest I've had to face. Our mission is to save lives, yet today, the ferocity of nature holds us back, reminding us of our limitations against its might. The thought of the two stranded out there, battling the storm's wrath alone, is unbearable. But the lightning slicing through the sky and the howling wind underscore the peril of attempting a rescue now. The risk is too great. The storm could easily claim more victims, including those of us sworn to help. My mind races with plans for the moment the storm breaks. The resolve to act to make up for lost time is overwhelming. This waiting game is an excruciating test of our patience and determination. Yet it also instills a deep respect for nature's power, guiding our decisions to ensure we don't endanger more lives in our zeal to save others. As the storm rages, my heart goes out to those waiting for rescue, hoping they find the strength to endure. And when the skies clear, we will be there, ready to brave the aftermath and bring them to safety. By midday, the accumulation of 18 inches of snow rendered the trailhead inaccessible to jeeps and the sergeant's clothing froze solid, cracking at the joints due to the severe cold. Hindered by zero visibility and relentless winds, he was compelled to retreat, recognizing the grave peril that Ralph and Margaret faced, now beyond the reach of any aid or rescue. The next day, Warden Supervisor David Priest established what is now known today as an Incident Command Center at Roaring Brook, mobilizing a continuous effort of at least 35 people. Despite their endeavors, the swift snow accumulation hindered any progress. By November 1st, five days after Margaret's predicament began and four days following Ralph's attempt at aid, the consensus was bleak. The rescue teams, having exhausted all options, concluded further attempts and rescue efforts would all be in vain. William Lowell Putnam III, a seasoned mountaineer involved since the onset, voiced on November 3rd his belief that Ralph and Margaret had succumbed to the elements earlier in the week, highlighting the futility of continuing their rescue mission. It wasn't until the following April that Margaret's body was recovered, necessitating the use of chemical salts to thaw the surrounding ice carefully. The autopsy revealed she had succumbed to severe blood loss within hours of her injury. Two weeks later, Ralph's body was discovered 400 feet above Margaret's final resting place and was airlifted from the scene. His autopsy revealed no apparent cause of death, leading to speculation he might have simply succumbed to the cold in his sleep. 
In the aftermath of this tragedy, the story of Ranger Ralph Heath's unwavering commitment and ultimate sacrifice offers profound reflections on the essence of service, the depths of personal sacrifice, and the enduring mystery of human resilience in the face of nature's unfathomable forces. Ralph Heath's journey from the battlefields of World War II in Korea to the serene yet unpredictable wilderness paints a portrait of a man who found solace and purpose in the guardianship of nature. His decision to venture into the heart of the storm, fully aware of the perilous conditions awaiting him, was not merely an act of duty, but a profound expression of his deep connection to the wilderness he vowed to protect. This act of selflessness, risking his life for another, encapsulates the very essence of sacrifice, a theme that resonates deeply within the silent, towering presence of Mount Katahdin. The legacy of Ralph Heath, etched into the collective memory of the park and its visitors, transcends the mere recounting of his heroic deeds. Annual ceremonies serve as a reminder of the human element inherent in the wilderness, a testament to the values of sacrifice and service that define the spirit of those who watch over our natural landscapes. Yet, as discussion surfaces about discontinuing the tradition of remembrance, we are prompted to reflect on the importance of honoring such sacrifices, lest we forget the cost of safety and preservation in the wild. As we reflect on Ralph Heath's legacy, we are drawn into the mysteries that envelop his final journey, a reminder of the countless stories that remain untold, hidden within the heart of the wild. His sacrifice and service, emblematic of the profound bond between humans and nature, leave us with an enduring lesson about the strength of the human spirit, the value of remembrance, and the ceaseless call of the wilderness that, even in the most daunting moments, reveals the true measure of our courage and compassion. In the realm of unexplained mysteries, the disappearance of 21-year-old geology student Drake Kramer continues to haunt the picturesque landscape of the Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona. A young man from San Antonio, Texas, with a bright future ahead, Drake was passionate about the Earth's hidden treasures, his life seemingly dedicated to exploring rocks and minerals. His journey, however, took a perplexing turn on February 1st of 2015 when he vanished near the Bright Angel Lodge, a popular spot bustling with tourists and hikers. Drake, last seen on that fateful evening, left behind only his 2007 Mazda, a silent testament to his sudden absence. His worried parents, Robin and Brenda Kramer, reported him missing the next day. The bafflement surrounding his disappearance deepened with a cryptic text message he sent to his family, stating that he had to give his body to Mother Earth. This message, diverging sharply from his usual demeanor, left his family and friends bewildered and deeply concerned. The unexpected nature of Drake's trip, first to California and then to the Grand Canyon, was out of character. His last encounter with his family was on January 29th, a seemingly normal day where they enjoyed a movie together and he appeared in high spirits. Drake, known for his love of the outdoors, had visited the Grand Canyon several times, always with friends or companions, making this solitary trip all the more puzzling. An extensive search operation ensued involving park rangers and dedicated search and rescue teams. They scoured the area from Hermit's Rest to Grand View Point over six days, facing the deceptive and rugged terrain of the canyon. Despite favorable weather conditions, Drake remained elusive, with no trace of his whereabouts. The canyon, with its labyrinth of obstacles, seemed to guard its secrets jealously. Questions multiplied as time passed. Was Drake's message a cryptic farewell, a desire to merge with nature, or did it hint at something more sinister? The Grand Canyon, a land of awe-inspiring beauty and ancient secrets, held tight to the mystery of Drake Kramer's disappearance. Drake's father, Robin Kramer, shed light on his son's mindset in the days leading up to the disappearance. He shared that Drake texted him saying he needed to be back with Mother Earth and set his soul free. This revelation intensified the family's worries, propelling the search efforts. Robin recalled Drake's love for nature, particularly the Grand Canyon, an area he had visited multiple times. 
Drake's passion for the outdoors was evident in his choice to study geology, aiming to spend his life in the embrace of nature. However, the uncertainties about Drake's plans and preparations for the trip were numerous. It wasn't clear if he had taken appropriate hiking equipment with him. The last known image of Drake from his Facebook page only added to the puzzle. The last time Robin Kramer saw his son was when they watched American Sniper on January 29th. Drake seemed to be in good spirits, showing no signs of distress. Working at a Lowe's home improvement store, Drake was living a seemingly normal life. His academic excellence and love for animals painted a picture of a caring and responsible individual. As days turned into weeks, the search continued with over 40 National Park Service personnel involved. They combed the south rim and the canyon edges, sometimes rappelling down its walls and covering the area by helicopter. The focus area were places that Drake had loved during his previous visits to the canyon. The mystery of Drake Kramer's disappearance lingers, echoing through the canyons and challenging those who dare to explore its majestic yet unforgiving terrain. The mystery of what happened to Drake, why he left, and where he might be remains unsolved, a puzzle that continues to perplex and mystify, leaving everyone, especially his family, in a state of anxious uncertainty. The Grand Canyon and its breathtaking vistas and deep, mysterious crevasses seem to have swallowed Drake whole. The vast expanse of the park, a maze of rugged landscapes and hidden corners, offers countless places for a person to disappear, willingly or not. The search teams, despite their expertise and determination, found themselves at the mercy of the canyon's whims. Every lead, every potential clue seemed to dissolve into the vast wilderness, leaving them with more questions than answers. Drake's disappearance was not just a physical vanishing, it was as if he had evaporated from the very fabric of reality. His cryptic message about returning to Mother Earth suggested a desire to merge with the natural world but the ambiguity of his words left open the possibility of other, darker interpretations. Was this a premeditated escape, a spur-of-the-moment decision, or something more troubling? The case attracted attention beyond the immediate search efforts. Online communities and amateur sleuths began to piece together Drake's digital footprint, looking for clues in his social media posts and messages. They found references to other places he wanted to visit, like the Redwood Forest and the previous declarations of his love for nature, yet none of these provided a clear direction or motive for his disappearance. As months passed, the intensity of the search waned. The Grand Canyon, a place of wonder, had become a haunting reminder of the mystery surrounding Drake. The park's visitors, unaware of the drama that had unfolded, continued to marvel at its beauty, oblivious to the shadows cast by Drake's disappearance. Drake's family, clinging to hope, refused to give up. They appealed to the public for any information, urging anyone who might have seen Drake or known about his plans to come forward. The National Park Service silent witness line was flooded with calls, but none led to a definitive answer. Robin Kramer, in his relentless pursuit of answers, spoke about his son's love for the Grand Canyon, a place that had captivated Drake's heart and imagination. He recalled the specific spots within the park that Drake had always been drawn to, and these areas became the focal points of all the search efforts. Yet, even these beloved locations, where Drake had once found peace and solace, offered no clues to his whereabouts. Drake's physical description was circulated widely and became a familiar image to those following the case. Every hiker fitting this description raised hopes, only to be dashed as yet another false lead. At the time of his disappearance, Drake was described as a young man with brown hair, blue eyes, 5 foot 7 inches tall, and weighing around 140 pounds. He was often seen wearing a backward-facing baseball cap or a bandana and preferred dark-colored clothing. As time passed, the story of Drake Kramer faded from the headlines, but not from the hearts and minds of those who knew and loved him, and those who had been touched by the mystery of his disappearance. His fate remains unknown, a puzzle that the Grand Canyon seems determined to keep within its vast, silent embrace. In the heart of California's majestic Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park, 
James Randall Morgison was a figure woven into the very fabric of the wilderness that he patrolled. With a career spanning 27 years as a backcountry ranger, Morganson was not just a custodian of the park's sprawling landscapes. He was a guardian of its secrets and a steward of its unspoiled beauty. His profound connection to the High Sierra, coupled with his unmatched expertise, earned him a reverence that transcended the boundaries of Sequoia King's Canyon, making him a respected figure among those who tread its rugged terrains. In July of 1996, it marked the beginning of a mystery that would captivate and perplex many. Randy Morganson vanished into the very wilderness he had dedicated his life to protecting. This disappearance, shrouded in uncertainty, launched an exhaustive search that spanned the vast expanses of the park he knew as his backyard. Despite the efforts of nearly a hundred personnel, the earth seemed to have swallowed him whole, leaving no trace behind. It wasn't until five years later, in a discovery as startling as his disappearance, that the wilderness relinquished its hold on Morganson. His remains were found, offering a somber conclusion to his story, but also igniting questions that would linger far beyond this discovery. The narrative sets the stage for a tale of mystery, intertwining the legacy of a seasoned ranger with the mysterious embrace of the wild that claimed him. Good morning, ma'am. How are you enjoying the park today? Oh, good morning. It's absolutely breathtaking here. I've never seen anything quite like it. I'm glad to hear that. It truly is a special place. Are you planning on doing any hiking or backcountry exploration today? Yes, I was thinking about it. But, to be honest, I'm a bit nervous. I'm not very experienced with this kind of terrain. That's perfectly understandable. The beauty of these places comes with its share of risks. But with the right preparation and respect for the environment, you can safely enjoy everything the park has to offer. Do you have a specific trail in mind? I was considering the trail to Mist Falls. I've heard it's beautiful. An excellent choice. Mist Falls is one of the gems of this park. However, the trail can be a bit challenging for those unfamiliar with hiking in the Sierra. It's crucial to stay on the marked paths, carry plenty of water, and make sure you have a map and compass, even if you're planning on using a GPS device. I didn't bring a compass, and I'm not sure I know how to use one properly. No problem at all. I can provide you with a compass and a quick tutorial on how to use it. It's always good to have a physical map and compass as a backup. Technology is helpful, but it's not infallible, especially in remote areas where signals can be weak or non-existent. Thank you so much for your help and advice. I feel a lot more confident about heading out now. You're very welcome. Remember, the park is a place of wonder and adventure, but it demands our respect. Take care of it, and it will take care of you. Have a great hike, and if you have any questions or concerns, don't hesitate to ask any ranger. We're here to help ensure your visit is safe and enjoyable. I definitely will. Thank you again, Ranger Morganson. Randy Morganson's story begins amidst the iconic landscape of Yosemite National Park where his childhood unfolded against the backdrop of towering sequoias and granite cliffs. Here, amidst the natural splendor that would define his life's work, Randy's path first crossed with Ansel Adams. Under the study of this legendary photographer, Morganson learned to capture the beauty of the wilderness, a skill that would later complement his conservation efforts. The call of the wild led Randy far from Yosemite's borders to the high altitude challenges of India with the Peace Corps. This chapter of his life was not just about service, but also about expanding his skills in mountaineering and expedition planning. The lessons learned in the rugged Himalayas would forge in him a resilience and adaptability that marked his career. From the granite cliffs of Yosemite to the towering peaks of the Himalayas, Nature has been both my teacher and my sanctuary. Learning to capture its essence through Ansel's lens, I found my purpose. And in the heart of India, amidst challenges that tested my limits, I discovered my strength. Each step, each climb, has been a step closer to understanding the delicate balance of this world. My journey, it seems, is not just about preserving these wild places, but about weaving the lessons they teach into the very fabric of my being. 
How fortunate I am to live a life entwined with such magnificent wilderness, to serve its cause and to share its stories. May my path continue to honor this legacy as I strive to protect the beauty that has given my life such profound direction and meaning. Upon returning to the United States, Randy's commitment to the wilderness took shape through various roles within the National Park Service. From patrolling the snow-covered expanses of Yosemite as a winter ranger, to guiding skiers across the pristine landscape of Badger Pass as a Nordic ranger, his expertise and passion for outdoor stewardship grew. Yet, it was his role as a backcountry ranger in Sequoia and King's National Parks that would define his legacy. There, in the High Sierra, Randy's profound connection to the land became the cornerstone of his career, embodying the spirit of conservation and wilderness exploration. Beyond his duties as a ranger, Randy Morganson was a voice for the wilderness, both as a writer and an environmentalist. Mentored by Wallace Stenger, a luminary in the environmental movement, Randy harnessed the power of words to advocate for the preservation of natural beauty. His writings, infused with the wisdom of a life spent in the wild, contributed to the broader dialogue on environmental stewardship, which kept the conversation flowing for future generations. Randy's journey from a youth in Yosemite to a protector of the High Sierra was not just a career, but a testament to his unwavering commitment to the wilderness. His legacy, marked by dedication and passion for the natural world, remains a guiding light for those who seek to understand and preserve America's wild places. As the 1996 season approached, the landscape of Randy Morgison's personal life was as tumultuous as the rugged terrains he navigated with ease. The issues in his marriage became too great, culminating in receiving divorce papers from his wife, Judy, after two decades of shared life. This seismic shift in his personal life was further complicated by the emotional fallout from an affair with a fellow ranger, a liaison that, while brief, left an indelible mark on his heart and reputation. I guess you've heard about the divorce papers. Yes, I did. How are you holding up? It's tough, you know. 20 years isn't easily undone. And now, with everything else, I'm sorry for the position I've put you in. It wasn't fair to you or Judy. Randy, we both made our choices. I knew the risks, but it doesn't make this any easier. I worry about you. This whole situation, it's a lot. I've been doing a lot of thinking about us, about my life, about my responsibilities. This affair, our connection, it's meant more to me than just an escape from my troubles. But I see now the ripple effects of our decisions. I understand. And I've been reflecting too. What we have is special, but it's also complicated. Maybe it was the wrong time, or maybe we were seeking something in each other that we should have been finding on our own. Maybe you're right. I just hope in time we can both find a way through this, maybe even find forgiveness. Not just from Judy, but from ourselves. I hope so too. No matter what happens next, I want you to know that I do care about you. And I'll always be grateful for the moments we shared, even if they've led us here. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Let's promise to navigate the future with more care, not just for ourselves, but for those around us too. Agreed. Colleagues and friends, accustomed to Randy's unwavering dedication and spirited demeanor, witnessed a profound transformation. The man who once stood as a beacon of strength and wisdom in the high Sierra now navigated a storm of doubt and introspection. Randy, who had devoted his life to the stewardship of the wilderness, began to question the very essence of his career. His once vibrant spirit seemed dimmed by the shadows of personal turmoil, casting a shadow over his interactions and daily duties. This period of introspection and turmoil revealed a side of Randy that few had seen. A man wrestling with the value of his contributions and the path that he had chosen. The wilderness, once a source of solace and purpose, now mirrored his inner disquiet, a reflection of struggle between his deep-seated love for the natural world and the pain of his unraveling personal life. Tonight, the High Sierra stands silent, its peaks shrouded in mist, mirroring the tumult within me. Once a source of solace, the wilderness now poses questions I cannot answer. 
Shadows of doubt and personal strife cloud my vision, rendering the path I've walked for years unrecognizable. My colleagues' wary glances remind me of the transformation that's taken hold, a shift from clarity to obscurity. Amidst this, the essence of my life's dedication wavers, casting a long shadow over my once steadfast resolve. The wilderness, in its majestic indifference, holds a mirror to my turmoil, challenging the very foundations of my being. As the cool night air wraps around me, I seek not answers, but the courage to face the unknown. Perhaps in the embrace of the wild, amidst its enduring mysteries, I'll find a semblance of peace. For now, I am a wanderer, lost between the world I've loved and the shadows that now accompany me. As Randy grappled with these personal challenges, his state of mind became a topic of quiet concern among those who knew him best. The vibrant ranger, once so sure of his place in the vast expanse of Sequoia and Kings Canyon, now tread on a path marred by uncertainty and sorrow. This shift did not go unnoticed, leaving those around him to ponder the impact of life's trials on a man so intertwined with the wilderness that he served. On a day that seemed like any other in the vast expanse of Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks, Randy Morganson embarked on what was to be a routine patrol from his outpost near Bench Lake. With the tranquility of the High Sierra around him, he penned a note, inadvertently marking the date as June 21st, though it was in fact July 21st. This small anomaly in his note would later resonate deeply with those searching for him, as it was a rare lapse for a ranger known for his meticulousness and deep connection with the rhythms of nature. Morganson's failure to check in following the first day of his patrol ignited an immediate concern among his fellow rangers. This was a man whose life was interwoven with the wilderness that he patrolled, a seasoned guardian of the park's secrets who had never before faltered in his duties. The alarm raised by his silence set in motion an unprecedented search operation that would draw nearly 100 rescue personnel into the heart of the Sierra. The operation that unfolded over the subsequent days was a testament to the respect and concern Morganson commanded. Covering an 80 square mile radius of rugged, untamed wilderness, the search teams combed through the dense forests, steep valleys, and towering peaks. Helicopters scanned the terrain from above, while trained dogs and their handlers navigated the ground below, each step driven by the hope of finding some sign of the missing ranger. Every silent hour sharpens the edge of worry slicing through me. Randy, woven into the Sierra's soul, now missing. It feels surreal, a bad dream we can't wake from. This isn't just any search, it's personal. He's one of us, a pillar of strength and knowledge in these wilds. With each daybreak, we push deeper into the terrain Randy knows as his backyard, our efforts fueled by a mix of hope and dread. The vast, rugged expanse we comb feels mocking, hiding its secrets well. The helicopters, the search dogs, they're our eyes and ears. Yet the silence from the wilderness is deafening. Lying awake at night, the weight of the operation presses down, a constant companion. Are we doing enough? The thought of Randy out there, possibly in need, keeps me turning over every decision, every possible lead. This search, it's a battle against the wilderness he loves, a battle we can't afford to lose. We have to find him. The thought of failing is unbearable. Randy's absence leaves a void too profound to articulate. Despite the vast resources deployed and the tireless efforts of those involved, the search yielded no trace of Morganson. The man who had dedicated his life to the protection of these lands had seemingly vanished without a trace, leaving behind a mystery that would haunt the park and those who knew him. Every silent hour sharpens the edge of worry slicing through me. Randy was woven into the Sierra's soul, now missing, it feels surreal, a bad dream we. The silence in the Sierra is deafening now, a stark reminder of our search for Randy, a friend whose presence once filled these trails with life. Despite every effort, every resource poured into finding him, there's nothing but unanswered questions and an overwhelming sense of loss. The man who once stood as a guardian of this wilderness has vanished, leaving a void where there once was laughter, wisdom, and an unbridled passion for these lands. Hiking these paths without him feels like navigating without a compass. Each step is a memory, each vista a shared moment now past. The mystery of his disappearance lingers heavy in the air, 
a haunting absence that trails me as I walk through the wilderness we both loved. Randy's legacy is etched into the very heart of the Sierra, a constant companion in my solitary treks. The wilderness seems to whisper his name, a reminder of the friend I've lost to its vast embrace. In the wake of Randy Morganson's disappearance, a multitude of theories emerged, each attempting to unravel the circumstances that led to his vanishing. Theories range from the notion that Morganson, weighed down by personal strife and the dissolution of his marriage, might have chosen to disappear intentionally, seeking solace or a new beginning far from the confines of his current life. This speculation was fueled by his recent separation and the complex entanglements of an affair, suggesting a potential desire from the emotional turmoil that weighed upon him. Amid these theories, tangible clues seem to deepen the puzzle rather than illuminate the truth. Morganson's car was found parked where he had left it, undisturbed and serving as a silent testament to his planned return. Further investigations into his financial activities revealed untouched bank accounts and credit cards lying dormant with no indications of preparatory withdrawals or transactions that might suggest a planned departure. Inside his cabin, a more personal item was discovered, a service revolver, a 357 Magnum, securely locked away. This detail, in particular, contradicted theories of a premeditated exit, suggesting instead a routine departure for his patrol with the expectation of return. Thinking of Randy's disappearance, memories of shared Sierra trails and secrets echo in my mind. The thought of him willingly vanishing into the wilderness he adored doesn't match the Randy I knew. Together, we face the challenges of life with resilience, not by running away. I don't believe he would just leave his car untouched, his financial life paused, and his revolver quietly waiting locked away. This cannot be a planned disappearance, I refuse to believe it. As a fellow ranger and friend, who knew his laughter and his stride, the mystery of his fate intertwines with the wilderness we both cherished, crafting a narrative as complex and hidden as the paths we once roamed together in the wilderness. In July of 2001, five years after Randy Morganson vanished in the wild, a chance discovery brought a somber resolution to the prolonged mystery of his fate. His remains were located in a secluded, trailless area within the Kings Canyon National Park, nestled along a creek northeast of Widow Peak drainage. This remote spot, far from the usual paths tread by rangers and hikers alike, held the clues to the final chapter of Morganson's life. The investigation that followed pieced together a narrative suggested Morganson had tragically succumbed to injuries and hypothermia after an accidental fall, possibly precipitated by a misstep through a snowdrift while crossing the creek. Among these discoveries at the site were personal effects unmistakably linked to Morganson. His National Park Service badge, tarnished yet dignified, was found attached to a tattered shirt, a silent emblem of his commitment to the wilderness. Nearby, a backpack and boot were unearthed, the latter grimly housing a leg bone. Adding another layer of mystery to the scene was Morganson's park-issued radio, found resting atop the falls, switched to the on position. This detail, in particular, suggested a scenario in which Morganson, despite his dire circumstances, might have sought to call for help, or perhaps it was simply a routine precaution turned hauntingly significant by his fate. The scene painted a picture not just of a ranger lost in the elements, but of a man deeply intertwined with the very fabric of the High Sierra, meeting his end in the embrace of the untamed nature that he had dedicated his life to preserving. Ever since Randy vanished, part of me has been lost in the Sierra's vastness. Finding him five years later brought a flood of grief and unanswered questions. His badge boot, and backpack found in that secluded spot whispered of his final, solitary moments. The radio, hauntingly left on, suggests a last desperate attempt to connect, or perhaps a ranger's instinct to remain prepared, even in the face of mortality. Was it just a tragic slip that ended his deep bond with the wilderness? This thought haunts me, turning his disappearance into a mystery that we may never unravel. Randy's spirit, so intertwined with the Sierra, leaves a silence that echoes with the mysteries of his last day. My heart aches for the friend I lost and the answers we may never find. 
Randy Morganson's disappearance and the eventual discovery of his remains resonated deeply within the National Park Service community and beyond, sparking reflections on the inherent risks of the wilderness and the profound bond between rangers and the landscapes that they protect. His story, marked by dedication, loss, and the circumstances of his death, became a chapter in the lore of backcountry rangers, emblematic of their commitment and vulnerability in the face of nature's unforgiving elements. For those who wear the ranger's badge, Morganson's fate underscores the stark realities of their chosen profession, serving in solitude to safeguard the wild places that captivate the human spirit. Ever since Randy vanished, Part of me has been lost in the Sierra's vastness. Finding him five years later brought a flood of grief and unanswered questions. Yeah, I've been thinking about it too. It's like, we know the risks, we talk about them, but Randy's story brings it all home. He was one of us, a dedicated ranger who loved these wild places we're sworn to protect. Exactly. And his story, it's become a part of the lore here, a reminder of our commitment, but also our vulnerability. It's humbling, really, thinking about the bond we share with this land and the lengths we go to protect it. It is, and it makes you appreciate the beauty and the danger of the wilderness all the more. Randy's fate, it underscores the reality of our profession, the solitude, the responsibility, and the unpredictable nature of these places. That's for sure. It also highlights the profound connection we have, not just with the land, but with each other as rangers. We're a community bound together by our dedication to preserving these places and the challenges we face doing so. Absolutely. And it's a bond that's strengthened by stories like Randy's. They serve as a reminder of why we do what we do, despite the risks. It's a commitment to the wilderness and to each other. Couldn't agree more. Let's make sure we keep looking out for each other out there. Keep the legacy of rangers like Randy alive through our work and our dedication to these wild places. Agreed. Here's to Randy and to all of us who wear the Ranger's badge. May we always remember the importance of what we're protecting and the depth of the commitment we've made. His disappearance serves as a somber reminder of the isolation and dangers that accompany the privilege of working in some of the most remote and rugged areas of the world. Yet, it also highlights the deep sense of purpose and fulfillment derived from the unique calling, inspiring a renewed appreciation for the dedication of these guardians of the wilderness. The legacy of Randy Morganson is enshrined not only in the memories of those who knew him in the National Park Service history, but also in the rugged contours of the High Sierra itself. The unofficial naming of Mount Morganson stands as a lasting tribute to his devotion to the preservation of natural beauty and his role as a steward of the wilderness. This peak, bearing his name, symbolizes the indelible mark Randy left on the landscapes he loved and the enduring intrigue surrounding his life and death. Mount Morganson rises as a silent sentinel over the wilds Randy patrolled, a monument to the mystery and magnetism of the natural world and its profound impact on the human spirit. It beckons those who continue to seek understanding and connection within the vast, untamed wilderness, reminding us of the sacrifice and passion of one ranger who embodied the spirit of conservation and adventure. Randy Morganson's story, woven into the fabric of the High Sierra, continues to inspire and haunt those drawn to the wild, echoing the timeless allure and peril of nature's untouched sanctuaries. Atop Mount Morganson, I feel a surge of inspiration, a connection to Randy Morganson's enduring legacy. This peak, named for a man whose life was a testament to the wild's protection, fuels my spirit. Randy's devotion to these mountains guided me here, pushing me to explore the boundless beauty and accept the challenge of preservation. The vast wilderness before me whispers tales of Randy's passion, urging me to embrace the Sierra with the same reverence and commitment. His story, a blend of adventure and mystery, inspires a deeper connection to nature and a reminder of our role as its guardians. Standing here, I'm reminded that Randy's legacy is not just in the tales of his life, but in the call to each of us to protect these sacred spaces. Inspired by Randy, I vow to honor this majestic wilderness, keeping the spirit of adventure and protection alive for generations to come. If you've enjoyed this content from Universe of Mystery, please like the video to show your support for our community. 
share it with your fellow mystery enthusiasts, and subscribe to our channel. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our new and upcoming content. If you've really enjoyed this video and got something out of it, please consider leaving a super comment. Any amount helps us bring more mysterious videos to viewers like you. In June of 2016, a meticulously planned hiking expedition in the Grand Canyon set off, spearheaded by Floyd Roberts, a 52-year-old high school teacher from Tampa, Florida, and his lifelong friend, Ned Bryant, along with Bryant's 12-year-old daughter, Madeline. Roberts was an experienced hiker with prior Grand Canyon treks under his belt. The trio's adventure was to span nine days, traversing plateaus with an exit planned via Separation Canyon. Their journey started near the Kelly Tank area, heading towards the intersection of Trail Canyon and 214 Mile Canyon, close to Shanley Spring. Their route was charted to stick close to the river, possibly leading them down into 209 Mile Canyon. This path, while challenging, was within the grasp of their experience. However, the plan began to unravel late on the first day, June 17th. Around 4.45 p.m., before reaching the main trail, the group encountered a small hill. Ned Bryant and Madeline chose to go over the hill, while Roberts decided to contour around it. This decision was not expected to significantly alter their paths, as both routes were roughly equivalent in duration. However, Roberts' route involved navigating through thick brush. The conditions that day were harsh, with temperatures around 92 degrees Fahrenheit and expected to rise to a scorching 110 degrees in the following days. When Bryant and his daughter made it to the other side of the hill, Roberts was nowhere to be found. The Bryants immediately backtracked, searching for any sign of Roberts, but found none. The absence of any trace of him was bewildering, especially considering the group had only been separated for about 30 minutes. They decided to camp for the night hoping Roberts, who was well equipped with two gallons of water, a week's worth of food, and a map, would find his way back. By the morning of June 18th, there was still no sign of Roberts. Bryant and his daughter had to hike out to find cell phone reception, which they managed to do by 3 p.m., subsequently reporting Roberts missing to the National Park Service. The search for Roberts was further complicated by the extreme remoteness which required several hours of travel for search teams to even reach the area each day. The search efforts quickly escalated, involving ground teams from various counties and national parks, supported by aerial assistance. Over 10 square miles of wilderness were scoured for any trace of Roberts, but the search yielded nothing. Not even Roberts' gear, footprints, or any sign of his passage was found. The conditions were exceptionally challenging, with extreme heat and dense brush, but the lack of any evidence was perplexing. Despite the extensive and thorough search, no clues emerged to guide the efforts. After six days, the search was scaled back. While continuous but limited, the search involved rangers and pilots looking for clues whenever in the area, and flyers with Roberts' description remained posted. However, the absence of any leads or evidence has left this case shrouded in mystery. Roberts, a survivor known for his hiking skills and knowledge of finding water, had seemingly vanished without a trace, leaving behind only questions and theories about his disappearance. The mystery deepened as days turned into weeks without any sign of Roberts. The area, known for its rugged and remote terrain, offered no clues. Robert's experience as a hiker, his previous expeditions in the Grand Canyon, and his survival skills made his disappearance all the more baffling. He had hiked with Bryant several times since their first trip together in 1992, and was considered to be very familiar with the challenges of such an environment. The search teams, initially consisting of about 15 people, had expanded significantly, incorporating resources from several counties and specialized aerial support. Despite their efforts, the vastness of the Grand Canyon and the extreme summer heat posed significant challenges. The thick brush and the treacherous terrain further complicated the search. The search raised several questions. 
His decision to contour around the hill rather than go over it with Bryant and Madeline, a seemingly minor choice, had led to a complete vanishing. The fact that Roberts was well prepared for the hike, carrying ample water and food supplies, added to the perplexity of the situation. His physical description and the details of his last known clothing were widely disseminated, but no hiker or visitor reported any sightings. Family and friends held on to hope, recalling Roberts' character and resilience. His background as a NASA worker in Alabama and a computer teacher in Tampa reflected his intellectual capability and problem-solving skills. His friends expressed confidence in Robert's survival skills, believing that unless severely injured, Roberts would have managed to find water and survive. The relentless heat of the Grand Canyon in June, often soaring to life-threatening temperatures, posed a significant risk. The National Weather Service's extensive heat warning underscored the severity of the conditions Robert would have faced. These conditions would test even the most experienced hikers' survival skills. As the months passed, rangers and pilots kept an eye out for any clues in their routine patrols. Flyers remained posted, and the National Park Service kept the case open, urging anyone with information to come forward. The question surrounding Robert's disappearance still lingered, adding his name to the list of mysterious vanishings in national parks. His case remains a subject of speculation and discussion among hiking communities, with some considering the possibility of an unfortunate accident or encountering the canyon's wildlife. Others ponder a more puzzling explanation due to the lack of any physical evidence. Floyd Roberts stood 5 foot 11 inches tall and weighed around 170 pounds. He had gray hair, brown eyes, and was last seen wearing a red long sleeve shirt, blue jeans, multicolored mesh Nike sneakers, a large blue alpine backpack, and white rimmed sunglasses with orange lenses. The case of Floyd Roberts, a seasoned hiker who vanished into the vastness of the Grand Canyon, remains an unsolved mystery, a reminder of the unpredictable and often unforgiving nature of the wilderness. Roberts' disappearance continues to be a topic of intrigue and speculation, a story that encapsulates the mystery and allure of one of the world's most magnificent natural wonders. In the quiet, coastal community of Gulf Breeze, Florida, the disappearance of 23-year-old Adam Clayton Lyle Jones in the spring of 2011 began as a simple departure from Florida and evolved into a profound mystery. Adam's story, characterized by inexplicable decisions and a sudden vanishing, continues to haunt those seeking answers. On a seemingly ordinary day, March 31st of 2011, Adam left his home. His retreat was marked by a peculiar lack of preparation. While most would carry essentials for a long trip, Adam took only his laptop, leaving behind his cell phone and other personal items. This choice painted the first stroke of mystery in Adam's case. Why embark on a lengthy journey with such minimal belongings? Adam's mode of transportation, a 1986 Oldsmobile sedan, was easily recognizable. It was light blue with a distinctive dark blue vinyl top and missing hubcaps. The car itself was later found abandoned. This would become a significant clue in unraveling the mystery of his whereabouts. The discovery of Adam's car was made by a ranger at the Grand Canyon Visitor Center on May 5th of 2011, over a month after his departure. This was the moment Adam's disappearance transformed from a family concern into a broader puzzle. Inside the vehicle, an itinerary revealed plans seemingly uncharacteristic of an impromptu trip. It listed destinations in Denver, Colorado, and various cities in California, suggesting a route that Adam had possibly planned with care. The car's location at the Grand Canyon's south rim added layers to the mystery. The canyon, known for its vast and imposing landscape, seemed an unlikely destination for Adam, given the absence of personal effects or preparation for a trek in such challenging terrain. Why was Adam drawn to this iconic yet daunting location? Was the Grand Canyon a planned destination or merely a stop along a route dictated by an unknown purpose? Attempts to trace Adam's movements led to a trail of transactions across Louisiana and Texas as indicated by his debit card. Yet, 
These traces provided no insights into his intentions or state of mind. A potential lead, a friend in Yuma, Arizona, yielded no new information, deepening the intrigue surrounding this journey. Adam's physical description was widely circulated. A young man with short brown hair, blue eyes, possibly sporting facial hair, and with distinct heavy eyebrows. His casual attire, consisting of a t-shirt, jeans, and tennis shoes, was more suited for a day out rather than a voyage into the wilderness of the Grand Canyon. This mismatch between his apparent destination and his preparedness added to the puzzling nature of this disappearance. The case took an even more baffling turn with the complete lack of communication. Adam's decision to travel without a cell phone meant that there were no digital breadcrumbs to follow a rarity in the age of electronic communication. The lack of any digital or personal trail after his departure from Florida only compounded the mystery. The situation left Adam's family, friends, and the authorities grappling with numerous unanswered questions. What led Adam to embark on this journey? What was the significance of the destination marked on his itinerary? And most crucially, what happened to him after his car was found abandoned at one of the nation's most renowned natural landmarks? As time passed, the mystery of Adam Clayton Lyle Jones's fate continues to perplex those who knew him and those who later became acquainted with his story. The circumstances of his disappearance, the unexplained nature of his travel plans, and the puzzling discovery of his abandoned car at the Grand Canyon form a narrative that is as confounding as it is intriguing. Adam's case remains a mystery, unsolved and puzzling, leaving a lingering question mark over the events of the spring of 2011 at the Grand Canyon. In the realm of the mysterious and secluded, Keith Reinhardt, a sports writer with aspirations of becoming a novelist, yearned for a break from the fast-paced world of a Chicago newspaper. Introduced to the enigmatic town of Silver Plume, Colorado, by an old acquaintance, Keith saw it as an ideal haven to embark on a sabbatical and breathe life into the novel that had always lingered in his dreams. Taking a leave of absence from his job and persuading his wife to grant him his venture, Keith set out on a three-month retreat in this remote town, nestled amidst the mystifying peaks of the Rocky Mountains. Anticipating a transformative journey of self-discovery, Keith was drawn into a perplexing enigma that unfolded before him. Inspired by the tale of a man named Tom Young, who had mysteriously vanished a year prior, Keith's quest to unravel the truth took an unforeseen turn. As he delved deeper into the narrative, Keith unwittingly stumbled upon a clandestine secret, one that would ultimately intertwine with his own disappearance, leaving behind a haunting puzzle that tormented the inhabitants of Silver Plume and forever haunted his loved ones. Today we embark on a journey into the realm of two inexplicable disappearances, one that eventually finds resolution and another that remains shrouded in impenetrable darkness. Now let us delve into the disappearance of Keith Reinhardt. Silver Plume, Colorado, a place that epitomizes the essence of a small town hidden away in the heart of nature's embrace. Nestled in Clear Creek County, among the towering peaks of the Rocky Mountains, Silver Plume stands as a former mining settlement steeped in tumultuous history. Once home to over 2,000 inhabitants, it was ravaged by a cataclysmic fire and a devastating avalanche, coupled with the passing of new legislation that gradually thinned the town's population. Though a few steadfast individuals remain, by the late 1980s, Silver Plume numbered just over a hundred souls. Presently, that count has crept closer to 200, yet it remains far from leaving its mark on the world. With its tranquil existence cradled within the Clear Creek Valley, life in Silver Plume exudes serenity and an unhurried pace. UncoverColorado.com aptly describes it as living in a ghost town, where only a handful of businesses adorn the main street. However, visitors are not drawn to Silver Plume for its commercial offerings. Instead, the alert lies in the boundless opportunities for hiking, fishing, skiing, and other outdoor adventures that call those who crave the challenge of the untamed mountains. Situated at an elevation exceeding 9,000 feet, Silver Plume offers a hiatus for those seeking solace from the noise of modern existence. And for Keith Reinhardt, it was precisely this isolation and tranquility that enticed him. Keith had lived a hectic life, 
toiling for 22 years in the newspaper industry, primarily as a sports writer for the Daily Herald in Arlington Heights, Illinois, a suburb a mere 26 miles from the bustling metropolis of Chicago. At age 49, Keith experienced what some might term as a midlife crisis, a critical juncture that prompted introspection about his accomplishments and the dreams he had left unfulfilled. Having recently married Carolyn, his wife, and a proud father to three children from a previous marriage, Keith sought more from life, yearning for the adventures and possibilities that seemed to have eluded him with the passage of time. One of his aspirations was to author a novel, a lifelong dream that he felt compelled to pursue before it slipped away forever. Enter Ted Parker, proprietor of KP Cafe in Silver Plume, an old friend of Keith's. Through the conversation, Keith confided in Ted about the overwhelming stress of his frenzied existence, the weight of his age, and his desire to shed a few pounds and regain his vitality. Intrigued by the prospect of Silver Plume, a place offering a break from the chaos, Ted painted an enticing picture of a slower pace, a less hurried environment, the perfect sanctuary for a novelist seeking solitude and inspiration. For Keith, the decision to embark on this journey was relatively straightforward. He would retreat to Silver Plume, devoting a few months to writing, rejuvenating his spirit, and perhaps even exploring the majestic mountains that surrounded the town. However, convincing his wife, Carolyn, proved to be a daunting task. She harbored concerns about Keith's decision to distance himself from everything, including his family, in the pursuit of his dream. Yet, she did not wish to impede his journey or hold him back from the neglected aspirations that had long haunted him. After numerous conversations, some persuasion, and Keith's assurance that his absence would be temporary, Carolyn reluctantly consented. In fact, Keith proposed that once he had settled in Silver Plume, Carolyn could join him immersing herself in the unique experience the town had to offer. Keith secured a three-month leave of absence from the Daily Herald, and with plans taking shape, he made preparations to venture into the heart of Silver Plume. Uncertain about lodging and financial obligations, Keith became aware, likely through Ted Parker, that an adjacent building to the KP Cafe stood vacant, awaiting a new tenant. Recognizing an opportunity, Keith leased the space, envisioning a small antique shop that would sustain him financially while providing ample time for his writing. Packing his belongings and acquiring a new computer for his creative endeavors, Keith set off on his adventure. Little did he know that the very building he had chosen would unleash an inescapable wellspring of inspiration. Arriving in Silver Plume that summer, Keith discovered that Ted's descriptions had not exaggerated the allure of this quaint town. Despite the challenges of running his struggling antique shop, which failed to attract significant business, like most enterprises in Silver Plume, Keith remained undeterred. Conversely, his attempts at novel writing yielded meager results, with his gaze fixed upon a flashing cursor. In a world devoid of validation for the various theories surrounding Tom Young's fate, and with little confirmation about his intentions and travels, Keith Reinhardt persisted in his quest to write his novel and uncover the truth behind its enigmatic inspiration. However, as Keith delved deeper into his investigation, the mystery reached an unexpected resolution of sorts. On July 31st, two hunters stumbled upon a discerning scene in the mountains. A man's skeletal remains propped against a tree, accompanied by the skeletal remains of a dog. Promptly notifying the sheriff's department, the hunters guided them to the site, where forensic examination revealed that the remains had been there for approximately a year. Both the man and the dog displayed gunshot wounds to their skulls. Nearby, authorities discovered a backpack and a revolver. Subsequent forensic analysis confirmed the identity of the man as Tom Young and suggested that the gunshot may have been self-inflicted. The presence of the gun near the scene seemingly supported the conclusion of suicide, leading authorities to believe that Young's supposed plans to travel to Europe were merely a cover story. However, despite the official ruling, the people of Silver Plume harbored doubts. Some speculated that Tom may have encountered someone in the mountains who wrestled the gun from him and pulled the trigger. The fact that his loyal canine companion, Gus, also met a tragic end made it difficult for them to accept that Tom willingly would harm Gus rather than leave him behind. Nevertheless, law enforcement treated the case as a closed suicide, despite inconclusive ballistic tests linking the bullets to the gun found at the scene. While Keith Reinhardt initially found himself increasingly engrossed in the story, his own involvement took an abrupt and mysterious turn. 
Just a week after the discovery of Young's remains and the official ruling, Keith vanished, triggering one of the most perplexing mysteries and intensive search efforts ever witnessed in Colorado. Throughout the week following Young's discovery, Keith continued to inquire about him, simultaneously working on his novel. Curiously, Keith attended a party the night before his disappearance where he spoke about West Virginia and expressed a desire to visit the state. The identity of a woman Keith conversed with at the party, known only as Greta or Gretchen, remained unknown, as did the content of their conversation. The following day, on the evening of August 7th, Keith left his antique shop, locked the door behind him, and strolled through town, informing acquaintances of his intention to hike up Mount Pendleton, a daring feat, considering the late hour and the six-hour trek required. Most dismissed his plans as mere bravado, given his lack of supplies, appropriate clothing, and experience navigating the treacherous terrain. A sighting of Keith occurred around 4.30 p.m. as he headed toward the mountain, with his last official sighting placing him in front of the Buckley's General Store at 5.05 p.m. Here, he purchased a soft drink. Keith had informed friends that he would return around 10 o'clock p.m., a statement that defied logic unless he had no intention of attempting the mountain ascent. Concern mounted when Keith failed to open his shop the following morning, as the building's owner, Ted Parker, entered Keith's living area only to discover no sign of his presence. A newspaper lay beside Keith's computer, open to an article about Tom Young's remains. Strangely, Keith's unfinished novel remained on the computer, with its final lines deepening the mystery and heightening the concern for Keith's safety. Despite an exhaustive search involving helicopters, volunteers, search and rescue teams, tracking dogs, and law enforcement, encompassing over 125 searchers and more than 10,000 man hours, no trace of Keith was found, not even a fragment of clothing. The search was ultimately called off, leaving behind a vast wilderness where a single man could easily vanish. Keith's sudden disappearance, compared with the unsolved mystery surrounding Tom Young, left the Clear Creek County Sheriff's Department puzzled and grieving loved ones struggling to comprehend the circumstances. With little to go on in terms of clues or possessions, Keith's family vehemently dismissed the notion of him voluntarily abandoning his wife and children to start anew. Instead, they grappled with the belief that something went awry that fateful night in the forest. Despite the extensive searches, the vast expanse of natural wonder rendered it all too easy to overlook a solitary man lost amidst the majestic landscape. His daughter Tiffany, however, held a different perspective, suggesting that writers often immerse themselves in the stories that they write to better understand them. She proposed the idea that her father may have wanted to experience the act of disappearing firsthand to entice his writing. This belief was somewhat prevalent at the time, although with more than 30 years having passed, it seems unlikely that Keats' intention was to disappear permanently. Unless, of course, something went wrong that night in the forest, rendering him unable to return. One of Keats' sons believed that foul play must have been involved in his father's disappearance. He found it highly improbable that Keith, a devoted family man, would willingly abandon his loved ones. He later climbed the Pendleton Mountain, experiencing the emotional weight of being in the same place where his father had vanished or potentially still remains. Despite exhaustive efforts, including raising awareness, distributing flyers, appearing on national television shows, and consulting psychics, Keats' family was unable to uncover any new information or clues about his fate. Eventually, a plaque bearing a poem written by Keith was placed on the mountain as a marker and a memorial for the man who never returned to the town that inspired him. For the people of Silver Plume, Keith Reinhardt's disappearance became an enduring enigma, the coincidence of both Keith and Tom Young leasing the same building and meeting their respective fates in the surrounding mountains was too striking to dismiss. Some individuals in the town refused to accept the official ruling on Tom Young's death, let alone comprehend Keith's mysterious vanishing. The unidentified woman Keith was seen talking to at the party added another layer of intrigue. The nature of their conversation, if it held any secrets at all, remains unknown. The story possessed all the elements of mystery and intrigue that could captivate any novelist seeking to craft a compelling tale. However, in this case, the novel would forever remain unfinished, perpetuating the haunting mystery of what happened to Keith Reinhardt. Over the years, various theories have emerged ranging from the possibility that Keith encountered an accident, succumbed to exposure, or fell victim to wildlife predators in the vast wilderness of Colorado. Others speculate that Keith orchestrated his own disappearance, seeking a fresh start away from the busyness and stress of his old regular life. 
Some even suggest that Keith and Tom Young stumbled upon something or someone in the mountain that posed a threat, leading to their respective fates. Presently, Keith would be turning 82 years old, but his whereabouts remains unknown. Desperate hopes linger within his family, yearning for answers regarding his fate. Despite the passage of time, the unresolved mystery continues to haunt everyone involved. Keith's disappearance represents a disconcerting case that evokes contemplation, a writer becoming lost in his own work to the extent of becoming part of it. The convergence of two men residing in the same space and experiencing similar outcomes and the sorrow of an individual searching for them only to vanish without a trace. While some view Keats' disappearance as an inexplicable enigma, others interpret it as a clear-cut case of an inexperienced hiker lost in the unforgiving wilderness of Colorado. Regardless of perspective, the fact remains that a family lost a father and a husband, leaving behind a void that perpetuates this sad and perplexing mystery. Three main theories have emerged over the years, progressing from the least plausible to the most likely. The first proposed that both Keith Reinhardt and Tom Young encountered someone or something on the mountain that led to their murders. However, the lack of evidence and the extensive search efforts conducted by numerous individuals in the area diminish the credibility of this theory. Another possibility is that Keith staged his own disappearance, intending to embark on a new life elsewhere. While understandable, considering his struggles and aspirations, the absence of any trace or activity from Keith in the years following his vanishing makes this theory less tenable. Lastly, it is plausible that Keith and Tom Young simply stumbled upon something or someone that posed a threat, leading to their respective fates. However, the absence of concrete evidence or substantial clues makes it challenging to support this theory definitively. The mysterious woman Keith was seen conversing with at the party remains an intriguing aspect of the case. However, without further information, it is difficult to ascertain her role or the significance of their discussion. Despite the numerous theories, the story of Keith Reinhardt's disappearance remains shrouded in uncertainty and speculation. Ultimately, the truth eludes us, and the haunting mystery of Keith's fate endures, leaving his family and those invested in the case yearning for resolution. The tale of a man vanishing and then disappearing himself is reminiscent of something that one would encounter in a movie. It possesses substantial material for those inclined to delve into, yet ultimately relies on conjecture and speculation. The allure lies in its mystery, but when reality seeps into the narrative, its appeal diminishes. Did Keith truly abandon his family, wife, job, and entire life to embark on a risky venture of starting anew? It takes a certain kind of person, and not in a positive sense, to accomplish such a feat. A person devoid of conscience, or with a blunted sense of it. This characterization doesn't seem to align with Keith's personality. Furthermore, we must consider Keith's aspirations to complete his cherished novel. Would he have forsaken this dream along with everything else? It appears illogical to me. Instead, it seems more plausible that he ventured into the same area where Tom Young was found to seek further inspiration in the forest and on the mountains. However, Keith's lack of experience, equipment, and planning might have resulted in a disastrous outcome. Now let's explore the final theory. If you have never hiked in a densely wooded and mountainous area, you cannot comprehend the overwhelming nature of it. Having lived in the mountains myself, I frequently hear stories in the news about individuals, even experienced hikers, getting lost in nearby parks and forests. When disoriented and uncertain of one's path, panic sets in, intensifying as daylight fades. Today, most people bring GPS units, weapons, and communication devices, although the wilderness often hampers cell phone signals. In contrast, Keith set off from Silver Plume with nothing but the clothes on his back and perhaps a can of soda. These preparations are insufficient for a nighttime hike into the mountains, even for a seasoned hiker familiar with the area. Keith's background suggests that he was a city person working in the Chicago suburbs without prior experience in such endeavors. The mountains of Clear Creek County host several predators, including black bears, bobcats, elk, and mountain lions. Considering the isolated location and the dense forest cover, it is plausible that their numbers are higher than in more frequented areas. Search teams describe the area as perilous, with sharp slopes, rocks, and treacherous cliffs. One can easily envision Keith getting injured or even killed by wildlife or the hazardous terrain. In darkness, the chances of survival diminish further. The search for Keith was akin to searching for a needle in a haystack, assuming he was still alive. 
If he had fallen into a cavern or off a cliff, locating him would have been nearly impossible. He might have been unconscious, tucked away in a remote and obscure spot within the vast expanse. The lack of supplies also impeded his ability to leave behind any trace. Although I'm drawn to the intrigue of a compelling mystery, this particular case seems more focused on perpetuating a legend than confronting the probable reality. For law enforcement, search teams, and many who have scrutinized the case, the likelihood of Keith returning on his own after venturing into the wilderness at night is slim. The disappearance of Keith Reinhardt represents a sorrowful tale of a man's quest to find himself, resulting in the loss of everything. For some, it will always revolve around foul play, despite the absence of evidence. While it cannot be definitively ruled out, for others, it serves as a cautionary tale about the perils of venturing into the wilderness unprepared and inexperienced. Even after 30 years, Keith's family continues to wonder what became of him. While there is a glimmer of hope that answers may surface someday, the realization remains that the forest might conceal dark secrets. After three decades, if Keith did enter into the forest and became lost, injured, or met an untimely end, there may be little, if anything, left to discover. If you've enjoyed this content from Universe of Mystery, please like, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of my new content.